Okay. Um, welcome to Leadership View this week. Uh, I'll let the Leadership View board introduce sure. themselves. Okay, so guys, we're going to introduce ourselves first and then talk about what we're going to do. Uh, my name is Hazel. I'm a communications major. I'm a junior. And I'm one of the student engagement coordinators at Leadership View. And my name is Catherine. I am a sophomore here and I'm a marketing coordinator for Leadership View. My name is Mary. I'm a mechanical engineering major. Um, I'm a struggling guest for and my name is Samuel. I'm an IT major and I'm the RDA student engagement coordinator. And I'm Emmy. I'm the assistant director for RSO's leadership here on campus, and I oversee this awesome team of students who work with the Leadership View program. So, um, just a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, leadership View is a student led program, um, so really I just kind of provide advising and guidance, even though I'm the one talking right now. <laughs> Um, but our goal is to help you students like develop different leadership skills that apply in any area of your life. So uh, personal life, professional life, academic life. Um, but we also want it to be fun. So we try to do a lot of like hands-on activities, make it very experiential for you. Um, we do weekly workshops. We also do a student leadership retreat. Um, we work with RSOs if they, if our student groups need help with like team building activities or looking for opportunities there. Um, so we do a lot of cool different stuff um, in different programs. So we're excited to have you joining us, especially with this dark and unfortunately snowy evening. So um, next we'll be doing an icebreaker. So uh, if we can all just get in a circle here in the front and then all face each other, that's how we'll start. Um, and these are people who use your phone. Yeah. Do you want my phone or my watch? Or you can just look at it. Yeah, so everybody can just come up to the front. And we're gonna play a game on 21. I don't know if you guys are playing it or not. Um, so if we all start by facing each other in the circle, we are going to count to 21, and we can't repeat or say the number at the same time, and we're going to, and you guys can't go and have it. You guys can't just go one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we could get more in an organized circle, maybe a little bit closer. Does this be like a random number? Like well, like in order. Oh, so like from one to 21, okay. we need to get there without repeating or going in any specific pattern of just going around the circle. So like if you're the person saying one and then um, Mary would be the one saying two, it would need to be um, like Hazel saying two. Yeah. And then it, it wouldn't be able to like continue to more down, it would have to come back over to like Mary. Um, yeah, so like just non strategically our numbers are gonna be going from one to twenty one. So um, that'll be the first round. All we want to do is get to twenty one without repeating, without interrupting each other or anything like that. Um, the first round won't be timed, but it actually will time it. So um, I'll start one, two, three, four. Then if we stay at the same time, we can go back to one and return. So I'll start one, two, three, to somebody and say the number. So that's another thing. I'll always start with one, but it doesn't matter who calls me. So one.
maybe one more thing that comes to mind. Nothing comes to mind over the key about change. I think it's not even changing the big events. Like moving or starting something new in school. For sure. Yeah, oftentimes you think about change as large transitions. So coming to college, for example, getting a new job. Uh, maybe changing your major, like those are all big changes, but there are also a lot of small changes too. Um, so it, when we think about change, it's not just the big picture, it's also the little picture. Um, and sometimes those small changes can create larger changes and kind of push us into that unknown in the areas where we might be having doubts. Um, some folks have an easy time coping with change, some folks have a really hard time coping with change. Um, so why do you think change is kind of a difficult thing for some people to cope with? For sure. It's a familiar. What about for you? You don't want to get out of the comfort zone. Yeah, that's a big part of it. Is when you know what you know, it's that unknown and kind of that doubt kind of it's more intimidating to put yourself out there than it is to kind of stick with what you're familiar with. So what are some of the factors that might make it harder to adapt to different changes? We've kind of touched on fear and doubt and uncertainty in the unknown. Those are big themes of change, but are there other factors that make it harder to adapt to new changes? For sure, yeah, depending on like your culture, your life experiences, um, maybe previous events, uh, people that you grew up around, like all of those things can contribute to how well you're able to adapt with things of change. Definitely. Um, so the first thing I want you to do is Switch hands and sign your name ten times with your non-dominant hand. I'm seeing some looks of fear. <laughs> Just give it a shot. We're not going to judge your hand right here, but I want you to try it out. If you feel better, I can write my name with my left hand, and you can all see it. It happens to all of us that we're not. I was good with our other hands.
starting to burn up. It takes a little bit longer to write with your non-dominant hand, so it's understandable. Um, so as folks are kind of wrapping up, I want to ask a question to the group, and maybe let's hear from like three people, is what did it feel like to change what hand you write with? Okay, feels unfamiliar. Yeah. Yeah. What else did it feel like? A little bit more pressure? Okay, so it's more challenging, so you feel like you have to do better. <laughs> yeah, it's almost kind of a paradox of like, it's something you're not familiar with, so you should give yourself some slack and like understand that it's maybe not going to look like your dominant hand, but at the same time, like you feel the pressure to make it look good. For sure. Maybe one more person. Like, what, what did it feel like to try and write with your non dominant hand? Uncontrollable? Yeah, when you're not as familiar with it, it's hard to kind of be able to refine and like get that um, and maybe account for kind of how your hand moves or like how you're holding your marker against the paper, for sure. Was it hard to change hands? Like, did you feel like you were struggling to do th things that you are pretty comfortable with with the other hand? General consensus, yeah. That's pretty normal for most folks. Um, out of curiosity, did anyone's handwriting improve as you kind of got down your list of signatures? Yeah, I see, some, I see some heads shaking, yes. So sometimes, like, even if you're not necessarily comfortable with it initially, like, putting that practice and that time into it can be really good because um, you get the chance to actually start refining and getting more comfortable with it, for sure. Now, why don't you sign your name five more times? Just go ahead and sign. That is up to you. Show of hands, how many of you chose to go back to your dominant hand? All right, how many of you chose to go with your not dominant hand? Yeah, we got a few, yeah. So, for those of you who switched back to your dominant hand, why did you choose to switch back to your dominant hand? Any other reasons that you switch back? <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just gotta do it the way you know how to make sure it gets done. Um, for folks who went with their non-dominant hand, why did you choose to go with your non-dominant?
going to start now. Right, so you're hard at work on drawing the dream house for your friend, and your friend gives you a call and says, actually, I don't want a house, I want a dream boat. Can you design me a dream boat? So now you have to change what you're doing and draw them a dream boat. You know, your friend just called me. They've been thinking about it. They're going to change their mind again. They actually now want a luxury jet. You've got about 20 seconds before time's up, but they really want a luxury jet, and they're hoping you come through. So now you've got to try and design them a luxury jet in a short amount of time. Feeling. Um, for some, I felt really intelligent. I don't know, but, but like, 
some letters I had to make up with some First of all, so sometimes the change can be a relief, and sometimes the change can be frustrating, so you're like, wait, I know what to do now. Wait, now I don't know what to do. For sure. What else?
maybe they have a false expectation of what that is, and so then they kind of freak out because it's not what they know. Um, when something is new or different, it may feel uncomfortable, but leaning into that is what helps us grow. Um, for the folks who decided to stick with their non-dominant hand, they were able to see the progress that they made, even though, yeah, it's super uncomfortable at first, but practice makes perfect, and getting used to any new program or system or working with a new group or a new environment. Um, technology is a, huge, a perfect example of this. Like, I remember, this is gonna age me, <laughs> I remember when like iOS 7 came out and everyone lost their collective minds because all of a sudden like everything looked different they couldn't find anything and then like two months later everyone was totally used to it. Um, so you can see that with like software updates even, people kind of go wild about that. Um, and people get really concerned if they have to park in a different parking space. So like. People tend to stick with what they know, but if you're willing to put yourself out there and move past that, like you're gonna have some awesome experiences and be able to grow from that. Um, sometimes we know changes may be coming and we can plan for them, uh, but sometimes the changes are gonna be completely unexpected and we have to adjust our plans and our focus and our goals. Uh, the second activity was really meant to focus on that, and so sometimes you're gonna get some information that you, you just gotta roll with it and kind of see what you can do. Um, but sometimes we do know that change is coming, and when that's the case, we can kind of plan for it. So I wanted to leave us some tips for kind of responding to change, both when it's a surprise and when we're planning for it. Um, so if it's a surprise, take a moment to think about how this change is actually going to impact what you're doing. Uh, taking a moment to stop and kind of reassess and then move forward helps to prevent any future challenges down the road. Um, if you can learn about what caused the change and try to understand it, that can help you understand what's going to be the best path forward. Uh, so oftentimes a change isn't just made because somebody feels like it. There's oftentimes a lot of that that goes into a change, especially if it is something at work or at school. Uh, so if you can understand kind of the background behind that, it can help you to understand like why it's important and why that, challenge, that change will actually benefit you. Um, focusing on the positives of a change, um, if you've heard the phrase make lemonade out of lemon, or make, yeah, turn lemons into lemonade. That's what I was trying to say. I was about to say turn lemonade into lemons. That's not backwards, it's not what I mean. Um, if you can reframe it though and you can think about the positives and how those changes will benefit you, you'll be able to get so much more out of that and you'll be able to help other people have a more pleasant experience with that change as well. Uh, one of the examples I think about is for folks who are, are above sophomore year here, you may remember a program called WorkSync. Um, and when that program switched to Engage, a lot of people didn't understand kind of how to use it and didn't see the positives in it. And so it's, first it started off with kind of a negative presence on campus and since then it's kind of shifted as folks have learned like, oh, I can actually do some really cool things in there. Uh, so finding those benefits and focusing on the positive can really help folks adjust to those changes. Um, if a change causes problems, figure out how you can be flexible and creative in finding a solution. Maybe you're making a house plane boat. Um, <laughs> house boat plane. Yeah. Um, maybe it is that you're grabbing a new piece of paper and you're kind of starting over so you can be really intentional with how you're drawing your, uh, your objects. But be willing to be flexible and be creative because oftentimes those are when we find our best solutions. And that's when we really shine. Focusing your energy on what you can do. Um, this is something that's often taught in customer service as well, um, for anyone who's ever worked retail or service. Um, when you focus on what can be done, it creates a much better experience overall because you're still able to help and to be able to provide benefit. Um, if you focus on what you can't do, you kind of just keep your lemons, to go back to that lemons and the lemonade metaphor. If you're struggling with negative emotions related to a change, think about what specifically is causing those feelings. Is it that you really loved it, old to, like what was there before and you didn't want to see it go, or maybe, is that you've heard some negative things around it, and then try to figure out how you can address those. Because um, by addressing the underlying emotion and kind of the underlying cause of that, then you're able to move forward um, and be fully, like, fully able to commit to rolling with the change. If you know that a change is coming and you're leading a group, there are some other things that you can do to prepare. <laughs> so before you start implementing a change, make sure you know what the goal of the change is, why that change is going to be beneficial, um, and why other options were maybe not as good of options. This is really helpful because you need to get the buy-in of your team members in order to be able to actually like make the change happen and make it happen well. And if you don't do that, um, they're not gonna see the value in it. Like people wanna know what their, the benefit is for them. Um, talk about the changes before they happen, like ideally well in advance. So um, you're not bringing it up on them like, oh, by the way, Monday, we're completely changing everything we're doing. Like that should be it. Like, weeks or months or like um, when they did our math mail migration along like last year, they actually gave us like months of advance warning. That's important so people can plan for it and adapt to it. Um, but also be ready to answer questions because when people have unknowns, they want to figure out how to get rid of the unknowns so it is known. Um, so you're gonna get questions and be prepared to answer those or if you don't have an answer, be prepared to help find those answers. 
Um, if you're implementing changes, set goals and create a clear roadmap so everyone knows what the changes will actually look like in practice. Um, oftentimes, we see this kind of big pie in the sky idea of change, and we don't know what it actually looks like, and then that unknown causes us to panic. So if you can get that clear plan and that clear roadmap and set clear goals to track that progress, people will be able to see the benefits of those changes as they come in. Um, again, reframing any negative aspects to focus on the benefits and the positives. Any change is going to have some downsides. That's just the nature of change. But if you focus on what the good parts are, you're able to move forward from that instead of kind of dwelling on the negative. If you're encountering resistance from a team member, look for what's going on underneath that. Did they hear some bad information? Are they, did they really like the old setup? Like, look for what those are so you can address them. Because if you have one person who's done on it and the rest of the team's into it, that kind of negative energy can spread into your team. So there's kind of some important things to think about too with your group's dynamic. Um, feedback is super important. Um, it, you can only see so much as a leader, so if your peers can kind of help show you like, oh, have you thought about this potential challenge, or oh, hey, it also has this benefit, take that feedback because it helps you to better refine your solutions. Um, and if a problem does arise, like, be flexible in finding your solution and don't be afraid to be creative. Again, creativity and problem solving are oftentimes when we shine the brightest as leaders. So, that's kind of what we wanted to share today with um, with responding change, I just realized my timer is still going from when I had to draw mine. So we're gonna stop that. Um, one thing we do want to highlight, uh, well, actually two things. So one, um, we do surveys to track what folks are learning. So if you could take a minute to fill these out, don't put your name on them. And you can just leave them on the tables afterwards. We always find that feedback really helpful. Um, two, we do an annual student leadership retreat every year. And personally, this is like the highlight of my job. It's super fun. Um, and we take a group of about 40 students out to a place called Camp Omega. Um, in Waterville, it's about 45 minutes away, and we spend a whole weekend doing a deep dive into what's called the Student Leadership Challenge. Um, we go tubing, we play frugal, we eat lots of s'mores. Um, it's a really, really fun weekend, and honestly, like, I get, I get super excited thinking about it. The application is open for that right now. So it's an application based. The application does close Friday, November 22nd, so the Friday before Thanksgiving. Um, if you scan this QR code, it will take you right to the application. Yay, QR codes. There is a $20 all-inclusive cost to attend, so that includes your transportation, your food, your lodging, everything like that. Usually a, a retreat like this costs at least a few hundred dollars per person. Um, if $20 is a concern to you, we do have need based scholarships available, so don't let that stop you from applying. Like We would rather have you come and be able to help with that scholarship. Um, but we highly encourage you to apply, or if you know somebody who you think would be really interested, encourage them to apply. It's an awesome opportunity. You get to meet students from across campus. It's a blast. Um, there's some folks here who have been before. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, it was very interesting. There are many things and there are uh, many informational things. So there are two parts of it. Not only is it like cool as a leadership retreat, but that's kind of the formal part of it, but also like outside of what we're there for, you get to a lot of people like looking otherwise. So other majors, even from like other countries, other um, international students, like you just meet a bunch of Besides, like, what we're maybe there for, there's also things outside of that that you like, up and like, carry on even after the retreat. So. For sure. Yeah, so definitely feel free to check that out. Um, thank you for joining us today. If you did not scan in, please go ahead and scan in. We kind of track attendance as well. Helps us see you know, what we've got for attendance. Um, and then when we have folks who return, they get some dope leadership emails. Um, we do have two more workshops this semester. Um, so next week, we've got resiliency, and Catherine will actually be leading the leading the big activities of the workshop. Um, and then we have our end of the semester celebration. So if you're ready to come hang out and celebrate the wind down of the semester, um, that week before Thanksgiving on the 19th, we will be here with fun games and snacks and all sorts of good stuff. So, cool. Thanks everyone.